Hey folks, my name is Jessica Mashkovich and I am the host of One Take with Jess. My guest today is Gerald Henderson and he is here to talk to us about business literacy, raising kids, doing it right. Gerald and I met on Clubhouse and he always drops so much knowledge on just overall success, making the next generation smarter and better and productive and earning money and earning knowledge. And it just is so eloquently put that I had to have him on so we can all learn from from Gerald and not just me in the mornings at 8 a.m. along with like 15 other select people that... Um, we are always graced by by your by your presence, absolutely. So thank you for coming on. Thank you very much. And I, like I said, I I know the conversation that we had this morning is so heated, but sometimes um, the hard conversations are the conversations that need to be had. And starting my day like that gets my adrenaline going, and I'm it gets me wanting to make sure it's it's so hard in today's time. Uh, not to overstep your bounds. You don't want to mansplain to someone. You don't want to, you know, so it's like, it seems like we're so politically correct. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how, like, I, I've often laughed. I don't know how comedians even do their job anymore because you're going to offend somebody no matter what joke you say. And that's why jokes ain't funny no more. I did, I'm like everyone else. I cut my, I cut my teeth in corporate America. I started out with a Kmart corporation. I don't know if anybody's seen the, the Michael Moore um, document. I was in the building the day that happened at Kmart headquarters. So, but what I've learned is I try to take things from corporate America and try to take things from the teachings of my life. Because I know one of the things that someone said in the group this morning, they were talking about legacy and it was talking about leaving their kids uh, money. And if you mm -hmm. think back to all of the billionaires in this country, that's the thing they say that they're not leaving their kids. They all say they're not leaving their kids any money because once they know that they're being left that money, they won't work towards anything. Mm -hmm. I got a billion coming when this guy dies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's, it's, that, it's that old adage, that old yeah. adage, if you give them a fish, they'll eat for a day. But if you give them a fishing pole and teach them how to fish, they'll eat, eat forever. For a lifetime, yep. So you have this philosophy also with anyone that comes into your sphere. I know you take like your nieces and you you make a company for them and you mm -hmm. want to teach them how to do business, even when they, you know, they're, they're young, they're kids, they don't know anything years old. for it, yep. but you dish it out and you make sure it seems like you make sure you teach and teach often, teach well, teach often, teach by example you know, have them get their hands dirty, roll up their sleeves and, and get to work and know why they're doing it and how they're doing it. Talk to me about like how that came about, like how that philosophy of yours, why you do that, you know, to, to your nieces and put them in business so young, what are the benefits that they can reap from it? And why is it so important to you to make sure that they have these skills? Well, as you can tell from the conversation this morning, I have a soft spot for the female gender. Uh, I can remember my older nieces, my oldest niece, she's gotta be 30 now. But I can remember uh, going to one of her career days when they were telling her she could be a teacher, she can be a secretary, or she could be a nurse, but never a doctor, never a CEO who has a secretary, and never a principal at a school. So I've always thought that they were given limitations to the female gender by telling, hey, this is what you can do. But then they'll tell this young man who got the worst grades ever, he could be the president. They said he could be anything. But they were there were uh, limitations set on the females. So I this the first generation of my family, all of my cousins, my brother, it's all men except for my sister. She's the only girl in this family. Then after that, everybody had girls. So girls have become so important to me to make sure that we give them the tools to succeed and also give them the tools to make sure that they don't have to depend on anyone or do anything just for money. You know, like you said, when you put someone in a situation, my father always taught me, when you give somebody the ability to feed you, you're giving that same person the ability to starve you. 
So you have to go out and get your own. I want to make sure that I don't worry about them when they're out in the world. And when you set them up a business, see, I come from a generation to where our parents passed us down bad credit. They might have got a cable bill or put some bill on your name that screwed you up before you get started. Now, I make sure that my niece has, she's a writer on one of my credit cards. So now her, she'll probably have 800 credit score by the time she's 16 mm -hmm. and don't even know it. I'm not giving her a credit card, but you giving her a boost in a world that's already going to be making her step a few steps back. And I know that that touches, uh, I know a lot of people don't want to believe that we have these gender biases and they want to say, oh, I'm not, but there is. You know, whether we want it or not, there, there are people that are going to look at her and say, oh, she's so, she's so pretty and see, and see no further past that. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that she has the tools. If she decides to get married and have a family, cool. If she decides that she just want to be a billionaire, run a company and be a recruit, then she can do that. I want to make sure that she does whatever she feels in her heart and yeah. what she wants to and have to depend on no one else. So what are some of the other tools that you, uh, you know, have in your toolkit to help that happen, to give them a leg up, to give them a better uh, positioning in the world uh, amongst other people, amongst other kids, amongst other families? Because not all of this happens in families. Kids go to school, they learn uh, STEM or, you know, reading and all those subjects. But the financial literacy, the business literacy, um, I, all of that you could take a business class, but sometimes you have to create a business and work in a business or have a little investment portfolio or a savings account where you start doing it in order to know the benefits that you can reap. So what, um, what other things do you, do you do to help them along or to show well, them or to empower them? That's a great question. Cause like, like you were saying, they do certain schools have STEM programs. School will teach you uh, reading and writing. And I think a lot of times we as parents forget that it's not about, let's complain about what they don't. It's my job to teach them about the tax laws. Tax laws change all the time. So I have to teach them to, that it's a rolling. When it changes, you keep on reading and you learn with it. I try to teach them that laws are written in pencil and it can be changed with an eraser when it suits who's ever in charge. I try to show them what I'm basically trying to do is give them choices. You know, like I said, I, right now, again, she's nine years old. She knows way more about the tax laws than a lot of people that's in business. You know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell her from the beginning, look, when you run your business, because when she, uh, let's see, when she was eight last year, I uh, got three, uh, will be when I first created her company, I bought three vending machines. You created she got these vending machines. Yeah, that was her first company. It was vending machines. Now, the thing is, my son did that also. My son's 27 now. But that was his first company also. And what I do is I, I tell him, this is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to fill the machine up in the beginning. I'm going to watch what you do the first time around. I'm going to watch how you manage the money. I, I want you to get on the internet because they're on the internet all the time. I want you on the internet searching for the best prices for the food to put in the vending machine. I want you to find the best deal. I want you to do trend analysis. I want you to watch which candy bars are moving faster than the other candy bars. So now you're teaching them how to analyze. That's something they can use in business going forth 100 years from now. They have to watch. And I also teach them, it's not about what you like. You have to pay attention to what your customers like. And you keep it going, and this can grow into something bigger. And I, and I also, I want you to decide what you're going to pay yourself, how much you're going to put back into the business. Uh, when do you think it's time to buy another machine? These are all things that get their mind going at a young age. You'd be surprised at such a young age, how much of this they retain. Yeah, They get excited about it. They go to school and tell their friends about it. And when they do do these things, like I tell them, if it gets bigger and you make enough money, I'll allow you to hire somebody. You'll show them because I don't just want to help people mm -hmm. with my bloodline. I know there's a lot of people who don't have a person like me and their family. So I want to make sure that I'm there to help anyone who wants to be helped. Just like when you're teaching, you have to make the curriculum fun for them. You have to make them want to do it. Mm -hmm. And you can't force them to do it because then they, they won't do it. 
So right now, like you said, they're learning about the 3D printer. I had them up here one day, they were sitting here and they, they, uh, they made some uh, iPhone phone cases from scratch. So these are your nieces, they're like nine years old, but wait, go back one second to your, mm -hmm. your son when you created his first company. What does that actually mean? You created a company for him? Or well, when we first made the company, again, he was, I think he was 12. So actually I started my niece earlier than we started him, he was 12 and we created an LLC for him. Okay, and you can't create it because he's 12. So you were the owner and he was- No, he can be owner. Oh, he's he an owner? Yeah, he was on it. But see, what a lot of people don't realize, I was on it. Uh, I got the company credit card, was able to put him on the company credit card, which I never gave him the card. So now he was able to, again, he's in college. I mean, he's, graduating out of college, not boom. he was in college, his credit was A1. No mm -hmm. one talked to me about credit when I was in college. I went to credit, I, had a, I went to college, I had an old beer, which I was happy with, but I went to a dealership just with somebody else and some slick talking dealer talked me into getting a car that I didn't need and couldn't afford. So started me out in the hole right off the bat. So I made sure that most of the lessons that I try to teach my son, if I can stop him from bumping his head and tell him about the times I bumped my head, that's what I want to do. Understanding he's going to have to bump his own head sometimes, but you don't have to make the same dumb mistakes that I did. Yeah. yeah. So now he's got a company where mm -hmm. you're on it also, and he's 12. And this company, by the time he maybe wants to do something with it, maybe 10 years down the line, because he's already doing something with it with the vending machines. And he probably also had to schedule some maintenance guys to fix the machine when it broke. So he's already got like a business, a working business knowledge at this point. Plus down the line, it's now a 10 year old company. It's, you know, it's a company that's, it's that's got that's legs. What it it's that's got what it was. seasoned. Mm -hmm. And what it was, was my son is now in Australia. Uh, he's big into activism, business wasn't his thing, but he was able to sell that company that was created when he was 12 for $15,000. Just because it was a seasoned company. Just because it was seasoned. Because, you know, when you, I know a lot of people, they got ideas. I want to go do this. So they try to set up a company. The banks are not talking to you with a three-day-old company. They're not mm -hmm. talking to you with a 30-day-old company. But when somebody's sitting here got a 10-year-old company, the conversation can, conversation can be had. So he was able to sell that company, but like I said, for about $15,000. That's and like, and that was for him, that was good money because he, he was 21 when he sold the company. Yeah. Now, what I did was I told him, I said, when you sell this company, now what I want you to do is create another one. Even if it's not something you want to do, you can in turn do the same thing again, if that's what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So he does have another company now. Uh, he's doing, I think he's in Australia now. He's doing gardening and, you know, a lot of activism stuff. So business really wasn't his thing. Mm -hmm. But he still was able to learn from the lessons. Yeah, definitely. I took the words right out of my mouth. Actually. So tell me about your nieces. The nine-year-olds now have another company. Yes. <laughs> and yes. they came to you and needed an, an iPhone case. Yep. I, I, we went, I, I bought a 3D printer, which I'm in, a, uh, I'm in the process of buying another 3D printer real soon. But I bought a 3D printer and it was so easy to teach them because they know way more about computers than some of us know already. Very true. But when they sat in and I, I, I let them watch me put the uh, dimensions in and show them how to uh, customize it by putting a name in the back and, you know, to see a nine-year-old's face light up, I know people want to buy this, you know, and then they coming in, I, I get a uh, t-shirt print equipment. They're like, we need to make hoodies with Naruto on it. I don't even know what a Naruto is, but I think it's some of the Japanese anime. That's the, this, those are the things that they know and they know the things that the kids want and gonna have their parents buy. So we try to do is we try. I have little business meeting with them just like I have with anyone else. We, I let them talk about all the ideas they got to where the company wants to go. I weed out where it's just crazy talk. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when you're dealing with a nine-year-old, you're gonna have crazy talk. But I don't discount anything that they say because they have their finger on the pulse of other nine-year-old consumers. They understand their target demographic a lot more 
then me, 50 year old, would understand their time, their uh, target demographic. Mm -hmm. How do you, like, what is your core business? You yourself, uh, it's, it's not vending machines. It's not 3D no. printing. It's not t-shirt printing. What's your core business? And do you scoop up these other items, these um, other uh, tangential items on the outskirts in order to, to because you have the foresight, let me scoop this up as a business for my nieces or as a business for my son, you know, had the opportunity well, to buy vending machines. Let me just scoop those up so I can make something out of it. One second, I get another, I got to get rid of this call again too. Oh, that's what happens when phone calls come in? Yeah, you're, you're yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't normally, and the Sorry. funny part, I'm on my iPad. I don't even know why I'm getting the call. Well, <laughs> what I do is, I am a business consultant. What I try to do is I'm right in the heart of the city right now because I feel like this is where I should be. You have to teach business literacy in order for, in order for folks to understand how business works. Uh, there's a lot of people that think all you do is go to your, your local state department and you turn in paperwork and you have a company. Well, I know, especially here in Michigan, they'll take your money when you're setting up a corporation. And you will think you have the protections until you go to court and you don't. So the thing is, you have to show people how to set up the business correctly. Like I know here in Michigan, you can't have an LLC with only one name on it. it, only, and, it and it's probably everywhere. Because think about it, what does sole proprietor mean? It means one owner, correct? Mm -hmm. So here in Michigan, if you only get one name on an LLC, when you go to court, it reverts back to a sole proprietorship. It's only one person. Hmm. So you don't have the protections okay. of an LLC and which an LLC, like everyone knows how the LLC works, say, I'm, my name is Gerald Henderson. I own this. The company has this. If you sue Gerald, you can't get this. If you sue the company, you can't get this. You can only, it keeps everything separate. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I wasn't born knowing these things. I was lucky enough to have entrepreneurs in my family. So I feel like it's part of my duty to show people how to set up companies correctly. You know, there's such a bad stigma of, I don't want to get any loans. I, what? If everyone look and see the richest man in their state, these people don't move without grant bond proposals and without other banks. They don't use their own money. Using your own money, that's something that poor people do because that's our mentality. We believe we didn't really earn it unless we use our sweat, blood, and tears. Well, look, if I can do it without crying, without bleeding, that's what I want to do. So I want to show people that that's the way to do it. Because like I said, here in Michigan, Dan Gilbert, who owns the Cleveland Cavaliers in Cleveland, he's the richest man in this state. There's nothing he does with his own money. Mm -hmm. He has billions, but he's not going to use his own money because he's not going to risk his own money. Yeah. So I think it's part of me to show people that's what we need to do. We need to learn the system. We don't have to do something brand new. We just need to watch what these guys have done before us and go forward. But, yeah. you know, we, we're taught. So we're taught at an early age. Oh, you got to get out there and break your back for it. I'm trying to I'm trying to break that cycle. I don't want to break my back. <laughs> what um, who was your role model? Who was your mentor? Who, well, taught, who I, taught you how to teach all this? Well, I, I had a few. Uh, I had a, a college professor who uh, it seemed like he was in tune to everything that uh, we were learning and everything. And he taught us so much more than just what was in the textbooks. And he tried to teach us about life. And he tried to tell us, you know, when you were uh, into a room, Make sure that they know you were there. Don't just talk and be loud. Speak and be heard. Mm -hmm. You know, you any room you enter, make sure that they know you were there. But also, you have to be careful with those rooms. This was one of the key things that he taught me. And this was something that had something to do with ego. And I needed to hear this. And I'm glad he told me this. He also told me, if you're constantly the smartest person in every room that you're in, you're in the wrong rooms. Because you can never learn from you know what I'm saying? You have to challenge yourself. And sometimes we try to put ourselves, we want to keep our group. I want to be the smartest out of all. So they always got to come to me, but 
they're learning everything that you're learning, but mm-hmm. you ain't, you're not learning anything. So we have to constantly be challenging ourselves to grow and be further. And then one of the things you were saying about all of these, I always feel like even though I'm a business consultant, you always have to have multiple revenue streams. Uh, usually when I do uh, taxes, when tax season come up, tax season, usually I make enough money to cover all the bills for the business for the whole year. So, you know, I know I got a lot of friends of mine who they may do taxes and that's, that's the only time they work. They won't work after that. Do you do other people's taxes? Is that what you're saying? Well, what I do, I do business taxes. Mm-hmm. I, um, I have about nine desks in my office. I rent out, I rent out the uh, desk to another tax firm. Oh, okay. You know, I did, um, I did personal taxes before. I'm not ever doing that again. People call you three, four in the morning. Look, I'm not doing that. No more. <laughs> so I just, I just do business taxes. And when I do the business taxes, basically I'm trying to teach people about deductions. I'm trying to teach people on of things that we've never been told before. Like, uh, this pandemic was almost one of the greatest things that happened. I, I hate to say that because some people look at things, oh, it was horrible. But what it did is it opened the eyes to some things. You know, um, all of this money that they had for businesses during the pandemic, this was not pandemic money. This money was always there. They just showed people the money. Mm. There's going to be a lot of people that say, okay, this pandemic is over. I'm not going to apply for this money anymore. There are people that think that the Small Business Association was set up just for the pandemic. No, it's always there. So what they did was everyone had to get their businesses in order in order to get some of this pandemic money. So it almost forced people to get their paperwork right, to get their uh, company set up correctly, to get their taxes done correctly. So hopefully they'll go going forward, they'll keep doing it that way. You know, when you look at it, it was as simple as we'll say for last year, a modest number, uh, before I did my deductions, um, I was about 100 and 196,000 for the year. After I got done with deductions, only 4,000 of that was taxable. Mm. And that's the things where people talk, like when people talk about uh, they mad at Donald Trump. No, I, I understand what they do. They're counting every, I mean, if somebody pick up trash in front of my building mm-hmm. and I pay them, I, that's going to go on the deduction side. You have to do all the deductions. All of this equipment that I'm buying, the, mm-hmm. 3D, the 3D printer, the t-shirt machine, that's all tax deductible for the next year coming up. Yeah, because that's a business expense. So yeah. yeah. And some people don't realize that. Some people just, they, they take people out to lunch. They don't keep the receipts. Mm-hmm. They have somebody uh, do the roof on their business. They don't keep the receipts. You have to track these things. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the things that, you know, I feel like I always want to be in the city because I want to make sure that I'm able to uh, share the knowledge that I have because I wasn't born knowing it. Somebody had to teach me. Right. And so when they taught me, I in turn want to teach other people. Yeah. And you do. You teach every day. Like you just give it away for free on Clubhouse, which is great because we appreciate that for for sure. You do. You change people's lives. We We had one one guy, he's like, I'm driving and I just, I wanted to pull over and write everything down. But by the time I can, it's too late. Um, yeah. I mean, some of the, some of the things that you've done are setting yourself up for future, for future business opportunities and future success. Like I know that you, you just bought an entire city block in Detroit. Oh my God. I am so proud of that. That's like, you know, you know, when they say sometimes your achievement can be bigger than your dreams ever. I never thought that this would be possible. What made you do that? Like, why all of a sudden did you want to be a real estate owner and buy an entire city block in Detroit? You know, I um, I don't know if you guys noticed or not, but there was somebody in the, uh, didn't come up to the stage, but it was a name below who was listening. Okay. Uh, this person that was below listening probably had an audience with the president of the United States yesterday. The person below listening was Derek Johnson. He's the CEO of the NAACP, not the Michigan chapter, the whole NAACP oh, neat. period. He was sitting there listening, and this was a classmate of mine. Well, was we, he had, we had- to hear you? Yeah. And one of the things that's good is we have alumni meetings. And he was telling us in certain areas that uh, 
they're coming through and they're going to revitalize areas of the city. I got this sentimental thing to where I like to ride and I used to always take my son when he was a kid. I want to take him to show him the streets that I came from and show him, you know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. So, you know, one day I'm riding and the whole block where I lived on was gone. I'm like, damn, this is weird. But I still drove because I still felt the connection to the soil. And then one day I thought about it. I'm like, well, I had looked at some property before. And before I got a chance to buy the property, there was a company in China buying up whole city blocks in Detroit. So I'm like, okay, if they, people don't, not even in the United States buying up this land. I went and I looked it up, uh, found a city manager. And again, I'm so blessed because the city manager happened to be another alumni, somebody I went to school with. So I'm, I'm blessed, lucky, however you want to say it. So I told her what I wanted to do. And she was like, well, each one of these parcels of land, it was about, I want to say, I got it on my other desk. It was 35 vacant lots. I think I only paid eight grand to own an entire city block, both sides of the street. And oh, right now, I actually don't know what I'm going to do right now. Right now, I'm uh, talking to uh, some urban gardeners and going to let them use the land until, I mean, I'll still pay the taxes. Mm -hmm. I'll help with the upkeep until we can figure out what we want to do. Because a lot of us are looking, if we want to revitalize that area, we probably need to put another high school in the area. You know, you, it, it's not just building the houses. You got to build the houses where people want to be. Uh, the one thing I do understand about real estate is people want to be where they're from. But most of the people that's from that area don't want to be back over there. Mm -hmm. They feel like I don't want to step backwards because we don't have the same amenities in that neighborhood that we have in our new neighborhoods. But I also didn't want to be one of those people that, you know, look back 20 years from now and be like, when the neighborhoods came together and be like, man, we let these folks come in here and just take, no, we didn't, we had opportunity and we chose not to. Mm -hmm. So I took a chance. And again, I never, this was something I never dreamed of. I never thought I could do something like this. And there's been ups and downs with that also the political stuff I don't want to be involved with. You know, so you don't want to you don't want to run for office and be part no. of changing the community. Is it yeah, is politics it's, not your thing? The whole thing about running for office, I don't know how to watch my mouth. Uh I kind of <laughs> I kind of say what's on my mind and that that don't go well with politics. You know, I figure, you know, when you in, in politics or even you in a church. They always censure you. I don't want to be censured. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to uh, say it from the bottom of my heart. And guess what? I want to be able to make a mistake. If I say something is wrong, okay. I don't want to be crucified because I say something is yeah. wrong. Yeah, well, it cancel culture. You'll be canceled oh, right away, of course. But yeah, that's yeah. that's the thing with um, with nowadays. You you have to be able to make a mistake. And then you have to be able to say, hey, I made a mistake. But you're they cut you off, right? Right when you make yeah. mistakes, unfortunately. That's what they do. They, they cancel. But to me, when I say things happen bigger than your dreams, for a kid coming from where I, where I came from to own an entire city block, I don't even have any words. Mm -hmm. I don't have any words. And again, I'm sitting here, as you, when you said what made it come to my mind, I'm trying to even think of the moment when I thought because I know I would always ride by there. Uh, I take my son when he was a kid because, you know, each generation tries to do better than the last generation. You know, my father and my mother, they got me as far as they can go with their limited education. Uh, my son, he, uh, his upbringing was different because both of his parents were college graduates, his mother's a doctor. So he has two parents with advanced degrees. So his childhood was way different than mine. So when I try to have conversations with him, it's almost like I was talking a foreign language when I tell him when I was a kid, we had candles in the house because the power may go out. He grew up having candles in the house because they smell good. That's the difference in our, in our <laughs> and, But he, he doesn't believe me. That's, that's almost like when our parents used to tell us they used to walk five miles to school uphill in the snowstorm and- right. You never believe how hard it was. And I, I sit back and I realize, you know, these kids is so different for them to where 
we live in a different world, a more dangerous world. We caught the bus, the city bus everywhere we wanted to go when I was a kid. My, I don't think my, my son is 27. I don't think he's ever been on the city bus. Mm-hmm. You know, they get dropped off wherever they want to go. You, you, their mothers are so worried about them. And it's, it's such a different upbringing. Me, I didn't, halfway, I didn't halfway want them to know where I was going. So I didn't want them to drop me off somewhere because I didn't want them to know where I was going. Right. And yet you made it back alive. You know, yeah. so, so we all, my daughter just went away. She drove four hours. She's 17 and I was worried, but I occupied myself and I, you know, I did other stuff and she got there safely. And then on her way back home, same thing. I just occupied my mind not to sit there and worry, but you know, I know she's a good driver. She got back home alive. So, you know, they're going to do it. Yeah. They're going to do it. And they're going to live to tell about it. But you're but, not going to fall asleep till she make it where she's at. And that's just how that goes. So. And, and we didn't understand that when we were kids and our parents told like, I can remember, you know, after my parents passed when I was early. So I, uh, the rest of my adolescence, I grew up with my grandmother and she used to always be sitting in the living room till we came in. She didn't go to bed till everybody was in the house. Aw. You don't understand that then. I understand it now. She's a good lady. Yeah, you don't, you understand it now. So who do you think, who, who do you, um, when you work and have a hard day, who do you sit back and be like, so-and-so would be really proud if they could see what I've done. So-and-so <laughs> would be really proud. Is that your dad? Is that your grandma? Who yeah. That's, you know, my dad, it's like my grandmother got to see me walk across stage. She got to see me graduate high school, college. She even came to my military graduation. My father didn't get to see any of that. So sometimes you wonder, do they know what type of man that I became? And it's like, when you lose a man and, and my family, my family uh, is more, my father was like one of the only strong men in my family. Most of my family is strong women. The women super strong. So to lose an influence like my father, and it's almost like when you're sitting there baking a cake, the cake is not done. My father was creating a man he wasn't done creating when his time came. I wasn't, I, I didn't learn all the lessons that a man was supposed to be taught. And I didn't have anyone else in my life, you know, to uh, finish baking that cake that he started. So it, it was rough, but it, what it did, it made me uh, that much, by me being the oldest, uh, I had to be stronger for my brothers and my sisters. Uh, you, like you said, as far as an uncle, mm -hmm. Those are like, you know, I always tell, you know, I love my son to death, but I always tell everybody in the world, my niece that's 30, that was the very first person that I loved from the second they took their first breath. That mm -hmm. was the very first person that, you know, from the time they opened their eyes, I loved them. Mm -hmm. You know, my son was next, but my niece, that was everything. You know, it's the first time you've seen, you know, yeah. A little life brand new. Like, Did you feel like that you're going to protect her and you're going to oh, teach oh her everything? Oh it was one of those whole, you know. My goodness, I tell you, that's why, like I said, I told you the story about going to her middle school uh, career day. I probably went psycho when they were telling her all the things that she can do and they were all gender bias uh, jobs. I was pissed. Yeah. And are you, um, how are you with, people that are just like, I don't want to rule the world. I don't want to be a successful business person. I just want to have a job. I just want to come home and, and be done by five o'clock. Cause I know, Joe, you know what you just did. You, just brought, up, you just brought up something that's so close to me. I, one of I, my first, one of my first management jobs, I'm sitting there. I had about eight supervisors working for me and I come home. I mean, it's so funny when you look at somebody who doesn't have and advanced education, but they know so much. My grandmother was so wise. I'm sitting there doing evaluations and I'm never gonna, it's a guy, Butch Kaiser. This guy was a great supervisor, but he didn't wanna be nothing more than a supervisor. I wanted him out of my department. I'm like, you know, I, I said, I want people in my department that want my job so they can help me move forward so they can be next. I said, he's happy doing this job. And my grandmother sat me down. And she was like, well, the world needs good supervisors. She was like, if everybody, you know, you can't be mad at him because he's comfortable at a point in his life. He, he understands being a supervisor. He understands uh, 
getting the people to get the job done, but watching you, and so he, he said, she, she probably don't want to go no higher, no higher, watching you always in the office doing, don't nobody want to do that. And it struck me like, before that I thought you couldn't be a great supervisor unless you wanted to be a great manager. But that wasn't the case because he was one of the better supervisors. And before that time, I probably treated him like crap because I wanted him to go to another, another department because like, you don't want my job, you shouldn't be in my department. But again, that, that grandmother with that South Carolina 10th grade education opened my eyes to, no, nah, that's not how it is, son. It's like, you know, she said, you know, Martin Luther King always said, even if you got to be a street sweeper, you be the best street sweeper that you can be. Mm -hmm. Just do everything. And she was like, does he do a good job? I said, oh, he does an excellent job. She said, then why is his mark so low on it? And trust, I never let anyone see evaluations, but I couldn't stop her. She's my grandmother. She's looking over my shoulder. What I'm going to do say, granny, go away. I couldn't stop her. But uh, it's, it is amazing my eyes how wise that, oh, you know, God. I'm sure she's not a world traveler. They didn't do that <laughs> back then. You know, they stayed where they were. They traveled locally. You know, my grandparents too. They didn't, it wasn't, you couldn't just hop on a plane and go get knowledge all across the world to have such great insight. So she just, that's very, very wise. Very like, that, man, she told me she watched me so much. The second thing that she told me, I'll never forget as long as I live. I, I'm a workaholic. You know, me getting this office space, probably the worst thing I ever did because I was going to bring a futon up here. I said, nope, because I'll never leave. But my grandmother seen me working so hard one time and she told me to stop for a minute to come here. So I came and she said, sit down. She said, you understand what's important in your life. I said, what do you mean? She was like, there's two tables in this life that you are looking at that's important in your life right now. She said, the dinner table and that boardroom table. You're spending a lot of time at that boardroom table. She said, if I tell you what, if you were to perish and leave this earth right now, they'll replace you at that boardroom table tomorrow. And they'll never be able to replace you at that dinner table. She said, pay attention to which table you're spending your time at. And I just went in the room and I'm like, what did she come up with this shit? <laughs> Mind blown. She was right. You just have to have a little booklet of all of the wise things. See, I think that you like. Oh, could you imagine if your grandma had Clubhouse and came on in the morning oh and we're like, guys, <laughs> let me just tell you something. Oh, oh. I, but we have you, so that is the next best thing. We do have you, so that thing. is the next best thing. People need to hear those things, man. It's like I've had to apologize to my son because I was so much worse then. I. I wanted to make sure that he was able to go to private school. I wanted, so now those are my excuses for uh, not being there for his events. And the sad part about when he was born, I was, uh, my job was 100% travel for Kmart. Uh, I traveled all around the country to their uh, warehouses. So what I would do is I would be, I would fly out on Monday and I would fly home on Friday. Well, of course, I'm in a, a cold climate. So in the wintertime, if, and I remember this like it was yesterday, I'm in Reno. So I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll stay two weeks. So I, I want to stay the weekend because I'm working all during the week. And I was just neglecting what I had at home. And it took me to get older to realize, you know, it was bigger than me. I, I used that excuse. Somebody's got to pay for the private school. I'm going to make sure he has everything he wanted. Well, he probably wanted more of my time because that's the one thing that my father gave me was time. Every sporting event, you know, my father was there. And I think that was one of the things that was uh, probably me and my father bonded so much through sports. And that was like a, a, a weird thing with me and my son is he really didn't like sports. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand how can my son not like sports? I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> who don't like basketball he just didn't and it probably took till we got older for us to come to grips and we'll go to a sporting event but he don't love it like I love it yeah and I, I want to be honest I probably ain't never said this out loud too many times damn near resented him for it like how could you not believe this like I believe this <laughs> Well, it's hard. It's hard to connect when you're, when your kid doesn't connect with what you connect with. So you just got to yeah. connect to them on, on their level, which might not be as fun for us as parents. Cause we like what we like, but so did you ever have that conversation with him and, you know, apologize for not being around or just, yeah. you know, 
how yeah. old was he when but you, you know, had he, that conversation? I had this conversation. He was probably 22. Mm. And again, he didn't see that part. He was like, you were always there when I needed you. Oh, okay. uh, he, was like so many, he was like, so many other fathers didn't do this and that. He, like you said, he looked because he looked at like my sister's kids. They weren't able to go to the schools that he went to. And uh, so he understood, but that's because his analytical mind took over. But I really think even though he understands a part of them, probably misses that connection. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, like if they had a father, son, this and that, I would fly in for that. But guess what? I'm back on a plane. You know, I would fly in and I would probably fly out that same day. Okay. You know, that you was could the go job. Visit, are you connected with him more now? Do you like, do you Zoom? Is he going to be in Australia? Australia, you said? Is he going to be there yeah. for a while? Like how? You know, I, I think he's planning on living there. He has, he, he's kind of hinting at it towards me. He's afraid to tell his mother. <laughs> oh gosh. That's so that's a conversation. I talk, I can't I can't help with that conversation, but yeah. I just want him to be happy. And like I said, if he's there, like I said, that's a place that I get to visit. That's you don't right. have to all, you know, you don't have to always come back here. We'll come there. All right. And I'm sure you'll make it happen. So that's, yeah, I, just, that's I just want him to be happy, man. Like I just want him to be happy. How um how's your work life balance now? Because it does sound like you you I, I need help. Still. Yeah. Still. I, uh, this year, you know, has been, I, I lost a few friends because I am so hyper-focused and especially if something new comes along, I'll look up and I may have the shades drawn. I don't realize it's three in the morning. I've missed an event. Mm. I tried to do better this year. I've missed so many family barbecues. I've missed because I'm here. And I'm trying my best to be better with that because especially with COVID, what it's taught you is you go a long time without talking to someone, they may, they may not be here anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I've tried to uh, do my best to be a better friend. And I was talking to a friend of mine. I was like, man, I, I'm a horrible friend. He said, nah, you got a horrible friend. I seen your buddy come up. He said he needed like $2,000. You gave it to him. I said, well, what he didn't understand was that was probably more so to stroke my ego. Mm -hmm. It'd have been, it would have been better if I could have showed him how to, to get a $2,000. Sometimes you, you do these things and it's not just you doing it to help. You doing it because it makes you feel like I'm a big man. I helped you. I would never throw it back in somebody's face, but we do those things that kind of stroke our ego when people just want your time. Look, my phone never rings all of a sudden. <laughs> There's people that want your time. So so how do you, if you were to recommend to business people who work, 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 because I know it's a dopamine hit. And I know it's an ego stroke for you and you could do stuff. I, I can't can... help with this one. I cannot help with it. No, I need you to help me. That's what uh, okay. I need. <laughs> we'll, we'll work it now. You, yeah. you, you do. You want to, Ooh, now someone's calling me. Cool. They can't get in touch with you. So they're calling me. <laughs> So how I, want do you... to, I want to do better in that area so bad. I want to do better, but well, it's like now, but the only thing that I, it's like now I, I take the time, as you can see, my beloved Detroit Lions, I make sure that I watch the games on Sunday, but as soon as it's over, I'm, I'm, I'm back at the computer. Why? Just shut it off. What, where's I, your I, wife? I, I, what does she say? <laughs> well, you know what? Here's the thing. That's another thing. I've sacrificed so many relationships for this business to where, you know, I was in a, a serious relationship right before the pandemic and uh, that time apart and it just didn't work out. And I want to do better. And it's, it's weird because dating now is so hard. I've had a girl tell me that my lifestyle intimidated her. She okay. like, so what do you mean? She was like, you know, you wake up every day at 4.30 in the morning to exercise. I don't want you to think that I'm, a, I don't expect, she was like, you don't eat meat and you, I'm like, why are the, the things that I'm doing with my life and Tim, definitely something I'm going to need your help with because this, this is an area where I'm terrible at. I'm a, Work I balance. need, man, it's, I'm almost happy that my son is grown so I don't have to, can't leave to do something for him uh you know helping my brother with my niece 
is something that, you know, she got me wrapped around her finger. She's mm -hmm. about the only one. She, they already know. Everybody in the family know if they want to get me to leave, they better have Ava call. Say hey, Uncle Drill, because they know I'm coming if she calls. Uh, the rest of them may say it, and I'm liable to say I'm coming, and then I don't, to be honest. I'm, I'm horrible at these things. You know, I'm not a drinker, so I don't want to go to the events where everybody drinking. Uh, mm -hmm. As a vegan, I feel like they sometimes have to go out of their way to find food for me to eat, and I don't want to be a burden that way either. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a lot, but I need help. Oh, you just said a burden. Nobody thinks that people who have dietary, you know, can not concerns, but constraints or whatever. Nobody thinks that they're a, a burden. You just said burden. That was a really telling word. I, Cause I feel that way. Sometimes it's like, when you go to events, it's like, they like, Oh, and a lot, a lot of times when I do go to events, I eat before I go anyway. Yeah. You bring a little cooler. Always have your cooler. <laughs> I just eat before I get there, but everybody walks around and thinking that, oh, I got to find something for you to eat. No, you don't. I'm okay. <laughs> no, because you got your cooler. It's it's Gerald's goodies. The yeah. GG cooler, the Gerald goodie cooler. Yeah, but that, but like you said, that's the part that probably, and again, uh, this is something that, again, it's, and I'll, you see, I almost feel like I'm cursed because sometimes I feel like when the relationships are going good, business is not going good mm -hmm. then when the business is going good relationship is bad so i'm almost to the point now i'm not trying to rush the relationship because i don't want to kill my business so <laughs> what, mm -hmm. what do i do <laughs> i think that you're definitely an overachiever and a go-getter and i think the only thing you need to set on yourself are just parameters so if you stop by 7 p.m every night you're going to get into the habit of 7 p.m is my end time every single night so if it ends up being you watch TV and get into a Netflix show, I know it's not amazingly productive, but it just becomes a little bit more disciplinary that you stop at seven o'clock at night. You want to wake up at three, start your morning earlier at three. Go ahead. You're not going to intrude on anyone else or miss out on anything else. Stop. It's, it froze as soon as you got into Damn. it. Okay. And I needed it. <laughs> All right. Basically, I said, shut everything off at 7 p.m. That's it. You go take a bubble bath or you go watch Netflix or whatever. You just set the parameter and you shut down. You, you're you good. You're good with your lessons. Like do this, do that. You tell other people, but you shut down at seven and that's it. No questions. You want to wake up at three, get started with your day even earlier, go for it. But you're shutting down at seven on the business side and you do whatever personal stuff, go bowling, Try not to talk about rearranging other people's, you know, lives. Here's how you do it. Here's how business is done. You know, one, one person once asked a question and said, um, my people don't want to be around me anymore. Like my friends say that they just don't want to hang out. They don't return my phone calls. She's like, so someone had asked the question, well, are you being a good friend back? Or are you talking so much? Oh, cause she had said, I think it's because they're jealous of my business. And we we're like, well, why is that even coming up in conversation with your friends? You should be talking about your friends and your family and your this and your that and how things are going and, and tennis and, and cards and whatever it is your interests are. If you're constantly talking about your business, no yeah. one wants to hear about it anymore. She's oh. like, oh, they think I'm trying to sell them or whatever. I'm like, no, just stop talking about yourself and only make discipline to talk about them and find out how things are going in their lives. And people will want to hang out with you. But when you start seeing that or start feeling that, or you yourself can't shut off your business mind, chances are you might be talking about business after hours as well. So you got to shut it all down, pack it all away at seven o'clock at night. And then, you know, let it, let it roll, relax, chill out. Remember bubble bath, whatever cooking. I saw you like to, uh, I love to cook, to cook, but you know, no business. No business love, talk, no business is, doing. I love to cook. I love to, like I said, I love working out. I love riding my bike. But it's like, it's so funny. I'll ride my bike and I'm uh, listen to a podcast or something. I, I'm always trying to, I always feel like the, the story, I don't know if you heard the story I told her this morning, but it's like when you got people working for you, you almost feel obligated to make sure that you bring in the, the business so that they can eat. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you're taking on this responsibility that I want to 
make sure I do this. Cause again, like when I, like I said this morning, I, I wasn't always this person that I am. I was always a materialistic person to start off. I wanted to get in business because I wanted money. Mm-hmm. I wanted money to buy nice things and that was it. And then I can remember sitting at my dining room table doing payroll for the first time. And it struck me like it never struck me before. My grandmother had already passed, but it felt like I could see her over my shoulder. And she was like, boy, you did good. These people are paying their rent, paying their car note, feeding their kids because you provided them a job. And I'm like, shit, it, it, I never looked at it that way. And ever since then, every time I go out and try to, I'm always do business consulting because I feel like that's my way of giving back. But I do things like the real estate or other things. I do things to the business consultant don't bring in all the money. I have to go out and do other things to, to make money. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I bought the uh, the 3D printer, I was just thinking about my niece. Mm-hmm. And it was like, no two brothers have probably ever been different than me and my brother. My brother is, you know, he's not a technical guy or... So when I bought the 3D printer, I didn't think he would be excited about something like that. And when he came to my office, he looked at it, he was like, man, he was like, man, just if Pops was here, he'd be like, this is a replicator from Star Trek. You just punch in. I'm like, I never even thought about it like that. And he, it made him think about our father because our father was a big Star Trek guy. Yeah. And you know, the Star Trek, they go and just punch the replicator and it makes something. And he was like, that's exactly what this is. It just does it a little slower. And I think that helped us connect because you know, as a lot of families, you know, men don't often talk about their feelings. That, that's probably one of the very few times me and my brother ever talk about my father. Mm. You know, my sister, she's going to make you talk about it because that's who she is. <laughs> but me and my brother, that was probably one of the very few conversations we ever had. Yeah. What yeah, is, um, what's your brother like to do? What's his thing? Right now he's a, a truck driver. And uh, he's been talking, like I had his daughter up here and he said, I want to get the whole family up here. And he said, he want to start coming up here on Saturdays because he wants me to show him how the 3D printer works. He wants me to show him how the t-shirt machine works. He wants me to, to show him more. And like I told him, it's never too late to learn these things. I tell people all the time, you know, yeah. uh, Colonel Connor Sanders, well, the guy, but the guy that started uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, he was 59. Mm. really started the company henry ford was 40 yeah so some people don't look it's never too late the guy that stole mcdonald's from the mcdonald's brothers he was in his 50s mm-hmm. that was a great uh movie by the way make sure you watch that movie was that, that i was did good. i did that was really interesting oh and the most valuable part of mcdonald's was the real estate under the real estate yep, yep. And, and they didn't see it and but see that's the thing that's that really bothers me and why i like to Uh, teach these young folks because all of my business heroes are unscrupulous people I don't want to be that though you Mm -hmm. know I I I really really always looked up to Russell Simmons Russell Simmons I watched how we start I read his book and then I realized he didn't even start the record label he stole it from somebody Mm -hmm. I'm like wow then I'm looking Bill Gates he stole dogs. I'm like, shit, everybody that I'm looking up to from a business act, act they t- taken. I don't have that in me to do that to somebody. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'm trying to blaze my own trail and show these own kids. You don't have to betray somebody right? in order to get it done. Even though, like you said, the guys that I looked at as business heroes, they all betrayed somebody to get what they had. Yeah. I don't, don't want to do that. I, I, I got to be able to look at myself in the mirror. Let me ask you a question. What if you became, what if you just turned it all around and became a college professor or teacher or something and you, you know, were paid a salary, you had working hours and you were teaching, you were using that time to teach people all, you know, all of them how to be successful. So you turned out 30, you know, kids every semester into this world with the knowledge that you try and bestow on your, you know, your nine-year-old nieces and stuff you know people you have like small audiences that and people the consulting fees that you pay what if because it seems like you are the the type of person who wants to give and give and give and you know 
always want to be the one to teach them, not because you are stroking your own, not because of that, but because mm-hmm. you want them to be better. What if, uh, what if that's a path to explore and it's a lot more manageable and a lot more, um, I thought about that. And it's like, I think the last three women that I've dated have all been educators. And, you know, I always look at, and I always tell them, you know, from the first educator that ever dated, I didn't respect the profession because people that I went to college with, they became teachers because whatever field they was in, they didn't get in. So I fall back on it. So they didn't yeah. love it. So then the young lady that I was dating, she was probably the first educator I ever met who had a, a degree and background in education. Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't just, well, I went to such and such, couldn't get a job, so I became a teacher. So mm-hmm. she actually loved it. And, you know, through talking to her and we sitting there, I would sit up late nights helping her grade papers. And uh, she's been doing that job now for probably over 20 years. And it's like, when you see a kid that came through your class and she had a kid that came through her class that's actually running for city council in November, it's like, that is huge because you had some input on that kid's life. Mm-hmm. You were able to show him, even though they may not tell you, I always tell people all the time, we know who Lee I. Koch is. We know who John F. Kennedy is. We know who Martin Luther King is. But what we don't know is we don't know the person that sparked them to become who they are. Sometimes that could be an educator. It could be someone who won't get any fanfare. But we wouldn't have this guy without those people. Mm-hmm. I, tell, I tell this story all the time. Just imagine you a young man. Well, you got to imagine hard if you was a young man. But you was a young man in Chicago, laying in bed, and you told your young wife, you know what? I think I want to be the first black president. What you think of having shit? I'm like, you don't sit your dumb ass down and go back to sleep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but by her supporting him, and it made him feel like he could do it. He did. It's always that person behind the scenes that make you. And because I, I, I've had so many strong women in my life that it just blows my mind. I uh, used to be the president of my block club, and the lady across the street me, she, man, she was the driving force. But she was like, I. I need you as a young man to step up and do it. She was actually doing all the work, but I'm getting all the credit, but I'm learning because I'm not the type to take a job and not learn a job. When there's other people like, okay, yeah, I'll I'll step up and let everybody praise. But that kind of, I'm like, why did Mm -hmm. she feel like this was not a job for her? Mm -hmm. But she was one of those old school down South and a woman has her place and she felt like, and there's nothing I can say to change her mind. She felt like it was her job to play the backfield and to put a man up front. As much as I admire her, I want my nieces to never have to do that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where we would get confusion with Christian today. I understood everything she was saying. And sometimes you can hear not just with your ears, you can hear with your heart. Yeah. Not only did I not only did I hear passion, I heard pain in what she was saying. Yeah, absolutely. So what just for background, um, we're talking about the fact that you were saying how sometimes you have to manipulate the system in order to hate that word too, but it's the word we have to use. Work. You have to work it. You have to game the system. It's everything is a game. Well, standardized testing is a game. You have to game mm-hmm. the system. You know, it's not even if you get the correct answer, it's how you how you map out the test and how you play and what you skip, what you don't skip, you know. It's a game. So what you were saying is how to sort of game the system, especially when you're looking for loans or uh, filling out your corporate uh, documents and stuff, Mm -hmm. just make your company not like, um, not so girly where someone can make a judgment right on the name. Yeah. You know, that's same thing with a lot of uh, applications, job applications. If you have a name that's extremely uh-huh. ethnic and you have someone reviewing that application, well, yes, that might get tossed. So if you, you can't change your name necessarily, but if you have the opportunity to name your company, just kind of keep it as generic as possible. So there's no race, no gender, no anything in it that can get tossed on the first round. You want to make it through. Um, and I know that was a hard conversation. And I understood exactly what she was saying. Yeah. So and she I her, her wished position. we lived in a world. I right. wished we lived in a world 
with these tactics that I'm talking about, we didn't have to use them. I, I wish, know. but that's not the case. Right. Her position was, I'm not going to hide anything. If I'm a woman, <laughs> I'm going to put it up front. And if someone tosses me, I'm going to go to the next bank that's woman friendly, maybe run by a woman and I'm going to get it in there. I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to change. You know, this, if we hide and change, we're not progressing. And I understand where she's coming from, oh, yeah, that, you know, um, but by the same token, and the word you had used was manipulate. So I think there was mm -hmm. objection to the word manipulate, but I, I know like there's bad manipulation and there's good oh, yeah. manipulation, you know? So it, it was harmless, that word. Well, I, I look at it like this. And one of the things I told her when I had the conversation with her offline is, you know, sometimes you have to wait till you get to the stage to get on your soapbox. You know what I'm sure. saying? You have to, because you know, the great poet Sean Carter once said, that's Jay-Z, by the way. He once said, I can't help the poor if I'm one of them. So sometimes you have to build yourself up to be able to help others. I can't feed my family off principles. Can't. I can have the greatest principles in the world. I have to go out and earn them. Yeah. And what you have to do is we can't ignore society. Uh, I can see in her heart she's a great person. But what she don't realize is she's not a minority just because she's a female. You're a minority because of the way you think. Everyone don't think that way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people use the system to game the system. I, I truly understand why a lot of people don't want to change the system because it's working for them. Why would I want to change something that benefits me? I get that. And you're not going to get people to, eh, let me vote the less money for them and let's make it fair. No. That is a perfect world, but that's not the world we live in. Mm -hmm. And trust me, I, I wish and hope and pray that Ava, my nine-year-old niece, can live in that world that Christian was talking about. That's the only world I want her to live in. Mm -hmm. But right now, that's not the case. But I, I felt her passion. But again, I felt some pain behind that, too. So, so it was something deeper. It was some pain. Because yeah. even when the other lady tried to change the subject, like, nope. <laughs> You're right. And the other woman called, you know, mentioned also mm -hmm. that I sense a lot of passion and some pain in there. So maybe there probably is something that goes deeper, but we all, we all can sort of feel in all directions of where that's yeah. coming from. So but it, was um, therapeutic. it was therapeutic and that was a conversation sure. that needed to be had that, that, you know, I believe certain things are preordained. I was meant to sign into that group this morning. You <laughs> were meant to sign into that group this morning. This conversation that we're having right now was meant to happen yeah. because a lot of times we don't know who we affect. This conversation may affect someone that me and you are talking to right now. They may never even tell us. True. So a lot I, of may, you, I may have swayed yeah. you to become a college professor too. You just may have. <laughs> Or to go out and do, you know, do larger talks. So you're talking to more people than your nine-year-old niece, nieces. And, you know, like to get it to a bigger stage. I do feel like you have the, um, you know, when we get to be successful, when we get to be um, an authority on, in your family, especially on business and how to do it and how to teach them how to fish. You're now the fishing authority. Mm -hmm. um, the weight of the world's is on your shoulders and you almost get, uh, I forgot what it's called, like Jesus Christ syndrome, where you feel that now it is your duty and your obligation to make sure that you're holding up the world and to make sure that you're the one that's educating them on the right thing to do. It's a lot of pressure, definitely yeah. a lot of pressure. And, and now it's 24 seven, but what, what the realistic side of thing and your grandmother was hitting it on the head is if you vanished from the earth, you'd be replaced. Yeah. You, you wouldn't be replaced in the same way, just like you've lost family members in your past. The world didn't stop. You progressed, you pivoted, you went in a different direction. You were either better, uh, stronger to, to, you know, make up for the loss or, you know, you sometimes people spiral in a different direction, but the world definitely doesn't stop. And if you weren't employing those people that you employ, you said you had a, a, a staff of people, mm -hmm. they would probably pick up and find another person using all the stuff that they've learned from you in the past, because you're not going to be able to sustain everyone for the next 50 years, 100 years of your life, their life, and the lives of their, their future, you know, children. So, you know, like, 
That's part of shutting off at 7 p.m. Relieve yourself of the, the weight of the world and just think about not an exit strategy, but a, a coping strategy with how can I make my, my life impactful and still teach people all that I know and, and have learned and still do my real estate, but still, you know, check out at seven o'clock and maybe have a personal life or maybe go visit my son. You know, how are you going to get away to go visit your son if you can't take a day off? <laughs> yeah. So, well, you, you know, know you're going to have to look at it like this. The, the hard part is people always teach you to find something you love and you will never work a day in your life. But then when you find something you love and that's all you want to do, <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Man. And that's the thing that I, like you said, when I, I, I just put a video on my Instagram, I had the girls in here, my, one of my little cousins and my niece, they're both nine. I'm sitting here and I'm talking to them about business and asking them what they want to do. And then not just that, okay, not what you want to do. What do you like to do? Let's find a way that we can make some money by doing something that you love to do. I tell people all the time, you can sit here and everybody in your family may think, you know what? She makes the best macaroni and cheese ever. You'd be like, eh, it's just normal. This is something I can do with my eyes closed. But then again, this may be something that you can mark. Other people are like, holy crap, this is the best macaroni and cheese ever. <laughs> Sometimes we do something so well and it comes second nature to us and so easy that we don't realize no one else can do this the way we can do it. No one else can uh, bring certain things out of a person the way you do it. When you get, when you have a certain skill set, and if you can find a way to monetize your joy, you made it. Or your joy now becomes not as joyful because now people are paying for it and they feel that they have the right to criticize it, change it, take the wind out of your sails. If you love that macaroni and cheese, enjoy it. Let your family enjoy it, you know, once a month when you when you make it cuz it's really hard to make and long to make and delicious to eat. Enjoy it cuz once people start paying for it, it takes the joy out of it. It it does. So, you know, recognizing that you're teaching them all this stuff but also recognizing that if you if you want to isolate your joy and you don't want to, it's, it's like when you do a sport that you love and all of a sudden you go pro and now you're being paid for it. Now you have to live up to other people's expectations and layers yeah, on the whole. And I know I got to be careful. It's like, I used to take my niece around the neighborhood and she would ride bikes with us. She didn't want to go ride with me no more. Cause uh, we ride because I took her on a 32 mile bike ride. And I forget she was not. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so you know her father who is not you know athletic I'm thinking they're falling behind because I'm not oh, Ava don't want to leave him behind no nah, Ava was back there she was tired oh my and I guess God. sometimes I forget she's nine her legs are not as long as mine 32 miles is a lot so whenever we go bike ride now nah, she was like not like the one we did before right I said now nah, we're just gonna Ride around like we used to do. Cause she, she, every single time we go now, she let it be known. What you taking that backpack full of water for? We not. <laughs> we only gonna be out for like thirty minutes, right? <laughs> she lets me know. I'm nine. I can't ride a bike for thirty miles. Oh. She did it though. My God, that's crazy. She, she wasn't happy with it though, but she did it. Uh, well, you know what back to like the original passion that you have and that you are. And I know you love these clubhouses in the morning because you, you do get a chance to put knowledge out there that, that you love people to know you want people to be better in their lives. And you know, that you yourself have made a difference in someone's life, especially when they tell you that, you know, like this is amazing and all of that. So it is a, it is a mutual type of satisfaction um, when that happens, but so a couple tips for people who have kids and want to introduce them into the life and the world of business, set up an LLC mm -hmm. with your kid on there as like one of the owners, set up a credit card, you know, talk to your bank, see what they'll allow you to do. Um, yeah. Try and establish a good credit score and, you know, just, just teach, teach at home to do. Yeah. They don't teach business literacy in high school. They yeah. teach algebra and geometry. But I think it's our jobs as parents to teach business literacy at home. 
Yeah. And it's okay if you, you know, expose your, your flaws and yeah. talk about work-life balance and talk about the hard subjects. Like you're a woman and you might have a little tougher or you're a, you know, anything else that might prevent you and here, don't be shocked. You know, here's, here's the way of the world and here's how to overcome it. And we might not overcome it. We might just have to, that's part of the system. You have, you have to give them the armor that they need to go out into this on this world on a daily basis, be able to use it. You don't want, you don't want to go want them to go out in the world and everything's a shock. Right. You know, I always say my uncle had a business when I was a kid and he had got caught up in tax evasion. So my thing was, I may make a mistake. I'm not going to make that one. I seen what problems that one caused. So like I tell him, I feel like, uh, I don't know if you're a Star Trek fan, they got something that's called a board collective where they take from every person they come in involved with the good, the bad. So now when I come in contact, which I'm not only taking the good because from my uncle, I took the bad. He didn't pay his freaking taxes. They came out here like a SWAT team about their tax money. Mm. So I learned, I may have problems with my business. It'll never be taxes because I've seen what problems that will cause. So you have to learn. I'm not the type of kid who, like my grandmother always said, all you gotta do is tell me, hey, that stove was hot. Certain kids gotta touch it anyway to see. That was never me. I believe you. You said it was hot, I'm not gonna touch it. But some people have to touch it. That's not me. So I, I've always tell, I watch Ava, or when I watched Jalen, my son, when he was coming up, I never just wanted to share the successes. I wanted them to see my failures also. Mm -hmm. Because if you see my failures, make sure you don't do this, son. Mm -hmm. Make sure you do a better job at this so this don't happen to you. So right. that's one of the things that I think you get more value from the failures than the successes. You do. And it becomes familiar. Part of the you know whole learning process with business and with anything is, does it sound familiar? Like if you teach them finance and saving and the stock market and portfolios and uh, crypto and this, it'll all sound familiar because we're talking about it at the dinner table. So then eventually when they do come into it in their future or in a college class or something, it's not as scary. It's not as, there's nothing worse than starting out a topic and having that complete unfamiliar glaze over you. Oh, business, what's business? Taxes, what's taxes? You know, now- Or, or when somebody show you, you really didn't know what you think you knew. Like I can remember being a college freshman, here I am, National Honor Society, uh, come to find out the school system I was in must have sucked because when I got to college, I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. So I'm like, what? <laughs> so I always tell my son, I was one of those kids that went from academic probation to the dean's list because I had to learn all over again because come to find out, I had no idea how to really write a term paper the way a term paper was supposed to be written because whoever taught me didn't do the right job. Now I learned how they want it and that's what I've always I guess that's been my thing. I try to find out what the professor needs. But if they say, hey, I know the sky is blue, but if I know this professor right here says green, then when I go in and do that test, it's green because I'm not gonna argue with this dude. I'm just gonna do what I gotta do to get past. I know what I know, but yeah. also know what he wants me to know. Yeah, <laughs> and that's I, th I think that actually was what your point was also this morning. That yeah, it was. <laughs> Absolutely. I got that loud and clear for sure. And, and like I said, I, I'm going to say this a million times. I wish we didn't need these type of tactics. I wish that the uh, level playing field was level, but it's not. Like I said, I my great grandmother, here I go again with the old stories. I, I'm never going to forget this as long as I live. I can remember for the first time, probably in a probably in Detroit history, a female was running. She was very qualified. And my great grandmother was like, I'm like, I think, I'm, and this is my first time being able to vote. So it's my very first time being able to vote. And I was like, I'm gonna vote for Sharon McPhail. She was like, what you gonna vote for her for? I'm like, she seems like the most qualified person for the job. Granny, she was like, well, that's not a woman's place. And come to find out this, what they, they were preaching about this in her church. They were telling them that, a woman's not supposed to be the mayor. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, shit. I'm like, when you, people talking about black people don't got a chance. God, dog, a woman ain't got a damn chance in this world. <laughs> and then, like you said, I started looking, I try to teach 
my niece is so much. And I mean, I, I was doing a, a research paper when I was in college. And the things that you don't learn in college, I didn't know until some point in the 70s, a woman couldn't even have a bank account without a man's name on it. Mm -hmm. A woman could not have a mortgage. This is the 70s. Yeah. But we just gloss over it. You know, when we sit here talk about equal rights and no one looks at the gender biases. No one looks at the, all of these CEOs of these companies to where there was actually a woman behind with the ideas. Cause like the story that uh, Kurt Cole told this morning, he got all the accolades for something that this other lady did. I've seen that so many times mm -hmm. because they're just not going to give her the praise because you got so many people that's used to the way the old system is working and it's working for them. So they don't want it to change. Mm. Well, you know, like I, I don't know how things will work out. We still are people who raise families, have kids, you know, there still should be a parent at home somewhere, some way to, to teach the kids how to be humans and, you know, like raise them. We can't outsource everything to daycare. I don't know if, you know, two full-time working parents and a full-time daycare is the way to go. So, you know, by the same token, I want a woman to be everything that she wants to be. <sighs> Women and men are not created the same way. We have different no, pickups, you know, we have different qualifications. We were just talking about the role of women and that women and men and full-time working and raising kids. It's a lot. So, you know, we can all do it all, you know, or, but something's got to give. So, and it's a change. It ain't like it used to be, you know, before yeah. the, the gender roles used to be so specific before. You know, the wife took care of the bills. She made sure the kids were okay. The husband, went, he didn't have to worry about nothing except for bringing home the bacon. Mm -hmm. Well, the world has evolved behind that now. So we have to figure out how to operate in this new world because, you know, everyone wants to go out. Everyone has a career dream now. Everyone, you know, no one wants to sacrifice their dream for the sake of someone else's dream where before the woman was expected to sacrifice her dream. Right. You're right. You know, she, she was expected to take the lesser role so that, you know, her, her man can be a man. And some of this, like right now, there's a lot of guys who, uh, <clears throat> they can't even, they probably couldn't handle dating or being married to a woman who's more successful than it. That. that will cause a problem in a lot of relationships. Yes. And, and that too is um, just a society type of issue where, I don't know if it's the the roles becoming a little bit blurred or um, just everything where a guy doesn't know what a guy can be or do. You know, is it going to offend a woman if he treats her like a woman? Is if he, you know, exhibits chivalry like from holding a door or, you know, some women are very upset. Some people, some people like, look at that as a sign of weakness. And it's yeah. Like, so you don't, you don't, they don't. Poor they guys. don't make men. They don't make men like they used to, and the world is just different. <clears throat> yep. Like I said, I'm I'm an old school guy that was raised by his grandmother. I <clears throat> I'm a protector, and these are things that uh that almost in my community right now is foreign. A lot of these guys are not protectors. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not. I, I I have to tell my aunt, and I'm sitting here and I tell my friends and my ex girlfriend anybody. I get so upset. If they call me when I'm at the gas station, it's freaking dark outside. You know, I went to this Coney Island in this neighborhood. No, get what you need to get in the daytime. And it makes me feel like I'm sexist. But like I told him, I'm not just saying it because you just because you're a woman. I tell my brother the same thing. Don't yeah. stop in shady areas and do certain things. You know, sometimes I feel like, why am I making sure I'm doing everything right? And then like my aunt called and said, she finna go, I'll go get it for you. Right. So now I'm putting myself in a situation where I got to go out in this shady neighborhood because they got the special food she wanted. <laughs> so now I got to go over here and get, get it in the daytime. <laughs> uh, I, listen, I have a boy and I have a girl. My son is 20. He'll be 21. My daughter is 17. She's going to turn 18 in like a minute. But I told her early on, I'm like, the, your rules are different than, <clears throat> than my son's rules. And yep. why, mom? Because he's old. I'm like, no, because you're a girl. You are a girl. 
you're, you will not be able to do some of the stuff that he is, you know, able to do or being told to do. I'm like, you're going to be held to a different standard. You're the clothes that you walk out of the house in are going to be held to a different standard than, than your brother's clothes. Like, you know, like he's wearing <laughs> sweatpants. I'm like, yeah, you're wearing sweatpants, but I could see your ass, you know, like go upstairs and change. Yeah. And it's not like she's wanting that sort of a thing, but you know, it's all part of the teaching process. So same thing with like, he gets to stay out until whatever time I'm like, you don't, you're driving home from, you know, the house, whatever, a town over and you're by yourself. So you're going to be home before I shut my eyes. You know, I don't care it's if, so hard. if it's he so rolls hard in at one, parent, that's not going to be you. You got it is so help. difficult to be a parent today. And I don't know all of these gender pronouns. And as soon as I learn them, they change them to something else. I don't know what's acceptable to say, what's not accept. I could not handle being a, a parent of a, a new kid now, the, the teaching them. I'm like, yeah. I'm seeing now that they, they even leaving the gender, they're leaving the gender off because they just passed the law here to where they're leaving the gender off of the birth certificate until the child is old enough to choose for itself. Like what in the hell does that mean? Some of this is just like, I don't know. I don't even know. But what I do know is that I have taken up a lot of your time and I appreciate this. And I know I've, I love you, grandma. I know she gave such wonderful advice to you and she didn't even he have to hear a podcast to listen and learn to yeah. you know how to make that advice. I don't know where she picked this stuff up at, but I think we all do know. have it in us. And we, you know, as long as you open your eyes and you open your heart and you open your ears you do a lot more listening than you do anything else and you know you could see things from a higher level so she was definitely seeing things at a higher level yeah. i feel i feel like she's still here with me now sometimes whenever i do something stupid i can feel her telling me because i always say when you have a person like that in your life you miss them when they're gone because you have no one else that's going to be totally 100 percent honest with you and I can remember, this is the last story I'm gonna tell, just, just to tell you how my grandmother was. I can remember uh, I had a, a little car and I wanted a new truck. One of my aunts, I was like, I'll take over the note for that car. So I'm like, cool, she took over the notes. So I went and got a new towel. Come to find out sometime down the line, she hadn't paid the note and a little car that was probably about only $19,000, by the time all the penalties were, I owed about $50,000. So I paid the money and I was so pissed and I called my grandmother she was down south and she said something that I just, I was pissed when she said it, but she was right. She was like, baby, you had the money to pay. Like, so what? I had the money. She was like, she was like just think of somebody else who wouldn't have knew what they was gonna do. At least you had the money to pay. And I mean, I'm like, you are not seeing my part of, she was, I see your part. You helped her, she did wrong. She, she always told me, never give anyone anything that you can't afford to not get back. Mm. When you gave her that car, you should have knew the risk. You left that car in your name and I will never do that again. Mm -hmm. I will never do that again. But that's one of the things she's always saying. It ain't nothing wrong with loaning somebody some money, but make sure you could afford not to get it back. Yeah. Don't, don't let them put you in the streets. Yeah. Well, she's right. She can't make it unhappen, you know? <clears throat> You yeah, in that funnel. you got your feet you got your foot wet but thank goodness you had an extra pair of shoes in your car you know but yeah that's uh lessons yeah. learned lessons learned fifty thousand dollar lesson <laughs> Ooh. Good. you'll never do that again and i'm sure you'll tell your nieces not to do that either because you're going to oh. tell them that story making sure they don't step in that same puddle you know i talk to them no co-signing for nobody <clears throat> yep. like i told her i'm not co-signing for you I'm going to help you build your credit up to where you don't need a cosign. What I'm going to do is I'm going to help you build your credit up. We're going to build the company up, the credit up for your company. Because what will end up happening is you can get in the company name and then you'll cosign for the company. Mm. So these are things that you have to teach them at a young age. And they yep. sit there and they learn and they suck it up. And again, like I was saying this morning, sometimes when you're teaching them, it seems like they're not listening. Keep going. They, they hear you. Mm -hmm. It's just they get something else on their mind but they hear you because all of these things these things i'm able to tell you now that my grandmother said when she told me when i was talking about the supervisor she probably think i wasn't listening i heard her right i didn't want to hear at the time but she was right 
And I didn't tell her she was right, but she knew she was right. <clears throat> so I asked my, my only advice I can give when I'm talking about the kids, because we all gonna make mistakes, kids don't come with owner's manuals, is keep teaching whether you think they're listening or not. Just yeah. keep right. teaching. The parts that absorb and get through, you'd be surprised of the nuggets that they keep. You know what I'm saying? They don't have to tell you. It's not always going to be a thank you. It's mm -hmm. not always going to be like, hey, that was great you taught me. Sometimes they'll just have that aha moment. They could be honest with them. My mom told me that years ago. They might tell their friends. They're going to tell you. Yeah. Hey, uh, just a quick question before you go. Is there something that your nine-year-old can teach you? Is there like a day that you could have where you flip it around and it's like teach the teacher? So she's up at the whiteboard and she's like, I'm going to tell you how something happens like on Instagram or YouTube or how to upload a video to YouTube or something like that. Just to give she's her- taught me, She taught me some things on TikTok already. She was like, I'm like, how do you make these videos? Come on, Uncle Joe. Oh, okay, good, good. You good. Oh, yeah, she does do that. We need to be yeah. the teacher too. That's yeah, I mean, you, you have to because this world is so different and they're able to, they absorb this. To just think about, I'm 50. So when I was in school, we didn't have computer class. We had typing classes with regular typewriter. They're actually in freaking preschool damn near working on computers already. Yeah. <laughs> to where, matter of fact, even when I, computers, I didn't even have to use a computer in college. Right. We would go to the library. It's like now you probably can't even go to college now without a computer. But we, like you said, if you needed to use a computer when I was in college, went to the library. We had a word processor. I'm 49. That's it. I yeah. still got a word processor in my basement right now. <laughs> yeah, you and I are from the same day. Mm -hmm. The IBM. Yeah, I had it in my basement. I think I had a Smith Corona. Yeah, it'd be the trick. So the world is different. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually able to learn, especially things about social media. And like I said, right now, we're trying to look and figure out a way. And this is something I'm going to let them take the lead on. I'm, I've been working on trying to create with my cousins that's in high school. And then my niece and my cousin that's in high school, we're trying to take their high school mascot and figure out a way to make a high-end um, uh, hoodie that everybody's going to want uh -huh. make it to where they, they just got to have it. And I'm talking to my niece and she I mean not my niece my cousin because she's in she's in 11th grade and she's teaching me stuff she's like well when we do it we'll we'll do a, um, a velvet rope release I'm like what the hell is a velvet rope release mm -hmm. she's like that's where we only let a few people get it let people thirst for it they can't get it until we release it everybody. and then once we release it to them the sales will go through the roof. And I'm like, that is freaking brilliant. That is brilliant. Yeah, you just let the popular kids get it first and don't even allow anyone else to get it. Yeah. Let them thirst for it. I'm like, that is freaking brilliant. <laughs> oh. That's an 11th grader. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're freaking smart. They are yeah. smart. So, you know what? Keep doing what you're doing. You do it well and uh, just shut everything off at seven o'clock. It's almost, what time is it? 341. You got a few more hours to work and then you got to put up your bubble bath at seven o'clock. Yeah, probably. I think I will probably leave this. I said I was going to go lift weights today. So I'll be in my basement lifting weights. Yeah, but don't go back to it though. Don't, don't. Hold up. What, what I do, once I on. leave it, you know what I've done? This now, that's one of the things I have done. I've taken all the computers out of the house, which is strange for me. That's good. Because I don't live that far from my office. All my computers are here. So once I go home, that's it. And I'm not one of those people. I don't do business on my cell phone. I can't. I don't know how people look at TV on that thing. And I, I just don't do it. <laughs> but yeah, but once I leave here, I'm done. But I'm five minutes away, so I can come back if I, if I have to. Don't come back. Don't. But come I don't. Back. I don't. I don't have a computer in the house, and that's weird by me being such a big tech guy. The fact that I do not have a computer in my house at all. Yeah. I go and like you said, I've I've basically constructed my life now. The refrigerator is actually empty at the house mm. because I also do the uh, intermediate fasting. I only eat between the hours of nine to five. So mm -hmm. if nine to five, I'm in the office. So I built a, a whole kitchen here. Mm. So once I leave here, I don't eat no more. Yeah, definitely do not bring that futon in there because that's just got yeah. all the amenities of home and you have yeah. to leave. You have to leave. And once I leave the futon, then I'll leave a toothbrush up here. And yeah. then all that, before you know it, 
I'm pulling real all night. At least if I stayed at two or three, I'm going home. Oh, God. But if I had that futon, I'm not going home. Right. I right. already know. Well, I've enjoyed this immensely. And again, like you said, I, I definitely appreciate you, you know, listening to me talk because I can talk forever. I am definitely going to try. And that, again, back to my grandma, the one thing she always said, the first way to fix a problem is to notice that it is a problem. And I do know that my work-life balance is a huge issue, huge. Uh, it's affected my uh, personal life. It's a... Uh, I'm almost happy that my son is out of the country because I don't have to do anything for him right now because he's not here. But it's a good uh, well, thing. You got to get a card game going. You got to get like a weekly card game going. Something else where you need to be scheduled to be out of your office. Like, you know, seven o'clock, seven thirty. You got to get your snacks and be playing cards with the guys or something. So, make it happen. But, you know, print it on your whiteboard behind you you know, out by seven or shut down or whatever mantra you want to say. But and see, that's great because before, like you said, I, these were when mm -hmm. I was out by, I went out by seven. I was out by, I made this amount today and I can't go home until I make a certain amount of money. Oh. That's where I was at. That's the goals I was fixated at. I was like, well, if I'm trying to make this amount a year, then I can't go home unless $800 come in the door. Yeah. And so I'm staying until $800 come in the door. Then I have to get magic right. with the numbers. Okay, if I made $1,100 this day, then okay, I ain't got to stay for $800. I just got to get, you know, five or six more hundred. And I go. See, that, I, it's, always, it's always been monetized with me. And I do realize that, you know, money is, we can get more money, but we can't get more time. And I, I, I regret not spending more time with my son, even though he says it uh, doesn't bother him. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he does say he's so happy because he look at my Facebook page and he'll see me and Ava riding bikes. So he was like, he's happy that I, get, that I am getting a chance to do it, at least for her. Yeah. <clears throat> you got to so, book a trip, yeah. book a trip out there. Oh, that's coming soon for sure. Yeah. All righty. I got to get dinner on because I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm a woman too because I gotta do the same. I like being a woman. I I love it. <laughs> okay. All right, well, it, it has been a pleasure. And if there's anything I could ever do to help, thank you. There for. Well, likewise. Likewise. I appreciate you. All right. I will talk to you probably tomorrow or sometime during the week. I know I'll hear your voice. Okay. Be blessed. Thank you for everything. Thank you. All right. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Absolutely. Take care. Bye-bye. Right.